So this will all be edited, right? Cut out <laughs> exactly, dumb, exactly. Responses. Hello and welcome to KAUST Live. We're coming to you from the Combustion and Extreme Conditions Research Conference. Uh, today to talk to us about that are two professors, uh, the director of the CCRC, uh, William Roberts, and professor from University of Michigan, James Driscoll. Gentlemen, thank you for thank joining us. Thank you for us. having us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, we'll, we'll start with you, uh, Professor Roberts. Tell us a little bit about the conference and, and what's going on throughout the week. Okay. So this is our fourth annual conference. Uh, we have a, a rotating series of topics, uh, and this year the topic is uh, combustion in extreme environments. Mm -hmm. And if you look at combustion research, um, you know, all the easy problems have been solved. Right? And so now we're working on the hard problems, and by hard we mean extreme environments. So, uh, typically, it's very high pressures or, or very difficult fuels mm. or um, looking at uh, plasma interactions with chemistry. So we're trying to bring all of this together uh, computationally and experimentally with world leaders and thought experts in this area. Mm. And so, you, you know, what's the direction of, of combustion research going as we move into these very high, uh, typically higher pressures? And, and you want to go to high pressures for... Uh, Thermodynamic efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. So, again, we're motivated by uh, higher efficiency, lower fuel consumption, whether it's uh, benefits for carbon capture or just mitigation of uh, NOx, SOx, soot, right. et cetera. So, um, again, it's, uh, it's a coherent uh, computational and experimental investigation right. and discovery. Uh, give us a sense for, um, for those of us that don't know, give, give us a sense for what some of these extreme environments are. Okay, so for example, we're quite interested in, in looking at <coughs> uh, supercritical carbon dioxide environments. Mm -hmm. um, there's a thermodynamic cycle that's quite interesting where you burn fuel and oxygen in a supercritical CO2 environment so that the products are CO2 and water, which are easily separated, and then CO2 you can sequester either through enhanced oil for enhanced oil recovery or pump it down well. Mm. Um, and so, so we don't understand the kinetics at these very high pressures. And we're talking 300 bar, so much, much higher than, than you would see in a gas turbine that might operate at 30 bar. Mm. So an order of magnitude and, and pressure. So the chemistry is different. Uh, certainly the physically is just difficult to do these kind of experiments. Mm. And, and the computations, all the scales get smaller. So the computations get more difficult. So it's, you know, we, we don't understand the kinetics. We don't understand much of the fluid mechanics. It's super critical, so it's not really a liquid or a gas. It's a little bit of both. And then just doing the experiments are very difficult, mm -hmm. making the, the apparatus. So there's, uh, you know, it's an exciting area, and we're um, anxious to get involved and try and lead. Absolutely. So, Dr. Driscoll, you uh, just gave a, a talk today, actually. So, uh, give us a sense for, for what your research is and what you talked about today. Well, as, as Bill was saying, uh, uh, we're, uh, we're interested in extreme environments, uh, a very high turbulence level, uh, as you would find in a, in a gas turbine combustor. And a lot of the research been, that's been done around the world has been uh, benchtop experiments, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been tailored for students who are in a lab with white coats on and this kind of thing and and uh, uh, many of the students now want to go work in industry or in uh, jobs where they're looking at applied uh, problems so they want to get involved in more extreme environments mm -hmm. uh, uh, gas turbines uh, both for propulsion uh, also uh, for energy production uh, you know the world is going to electric cars eventually but we need gas turbines uh, as stationary power plants mm -hmm. to provide the electricity mm -hmm. for uh, our needs, and so students want to um, uh, get practical, uh, relevant experience, not just uh, uh, benched up exper experience. So they're they're excited about these high pressure, high temperature environments. Now, Kaust, of course, has some of the world's best facilities, so you attract students who really want to go to extreme environments. But the rest of the world is also yeah. interested in those same problems. Mm -hmm. You you, um, you are the president of the Combustion Institute, yes. uh, and you, you do a lot of support for students. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. Uh, well, uh, the Combustion Institute uh, is uh, the primary institute that uh, organizes journals and meetings in the area of combustion science. And we have uh, uh, sections in uh, 33 different countries. And so every country has different energy needs. Obviously, here in Saudi Arabia, 
petroleum is a big issue, but in China, uh, coal, burning coal in a very clean manner is a big issue. Uh, uh, in the United States and in Germany, uh, you know, renewables are, are big, but uh, uh, natural gas is a big uh, issue. How do you burn natural gas very cleanly? And the students are interested in uh, in these uh, environmentally friendly ways to to uh, uh, to obtain energy, and uh, uh, so they. Uh, they come to summer schools, for example, the Combustion Institute uh, organizes summer schools in, in Europe and in, uh, in the U.S., in China, and now in Saudi Arabia. And it's a great opportunity for uh, uh, college-age students to sort of learn what uh, they can't learn in their institution mm -hmm. because uh, Coast and other schools have specialized uh, education programs that help them in their career. Mm -hmm. So summer schools, uh, we also try to uh, fund students to come to these meetings, you know. Um, mm -hmm. We use the money that we obtain through uh, journal publications and other sources to fund student travel. Mm -hmm. And that's how we really get students to first learn what, what we're doing. And they get so excited about coming and giving a talk in front of a big audience and mm -hmm. interacting with the senior people. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an experience and we try to steer them towards a career that they will find uh, enjoyable. Um, w give me a sense for um, the background of these students. Where, where, where are they coming from? What kind of programs are they coming from? Well, uh, I'm in the aerospace engineering department uh, at my university, and so many of the students that, uh, that I deal with are interested in uh, jet engines, uh, rockets, and uh, ground-based gas turbines for power generation and uh, mechanical engineers, uh, uh, chemical engineers. And uh, Bill, maybe you could uh, yeah, add to that. And also, um, we, we get a lot of uh, students from physics uh, that are interested in, uh, in the diagnostics part. So we do a lot of uh, laser-based measurement techniques because in these uh, hard environments or these uh, physical experiments, it's hard to, to go in and probe. Right, and, a, and a, a thermometer doesn't work, right? So you want high temporal and spatial resolution. And so we do a lot with, with laser-based techniques and understanding how light interacts with matter in these environments is very important. So, so I would say, yeah, mechanical engineering, aerospace, which is quite similar, chemical engineering, chemistry, and then physics through the optics. Quite a, quite a broad. It's interest. very broad. It's yeah. very, um, you know, uh, uh, very broad base. And, and it's interesting because for... Fifteen years now, people have been saying, oh, uh, combustion is uh, mature science, right? Thermodynamics, uh, nobody's interested in that. Everybody wants to do mm -hmm. nano, bio, info. But, but then you get students uh, into the lab, mm -hmm. and they see just how much is going on. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. there's a, a huge amount of research yet to be done. This, by no means mm -hmm. uh, have we solved the problems, right? So turbulence is very complicated. Chemistry is very complicated. And when you try to understand the interaction of the chemistry and the turbulence, you know, we're going to be employed for 50 years, 70 years, trying to, to ferret out the, the interaction of these. And that's what part of what this conference is, is looking at the chemistry turbulence interaction at these very fine scales, at, at high pressures, or, or very com complex chemistry. Right. So it's... Uh, it's a very exciting time, and I and I think um, the students come and they see that and say, "Yeah, this is uh, an area I want to I want to be in." It's not bio nano info. It's against other things. Right. I mean, uh, where else do you get the chance to shoot a laser into fire? That that seems like an I, amazing. I mean, that's an obvious thing, right? <laughs> I mean, everybody growing up. I mean, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, what form do the Kaust, um schools uh, of this vein take? If you can talk a little bit about that for the for the students. So this will be our first time. Mm -hmm. um, it's the first week of April. Uh, we have several hundred applicants, and we're, f we're uh, culling through those. And we'll have about 50 students, a nice mix of uh, in-kingdom students, maybe half, and external students. Um, and, and we're bringing in international experts to give lectures. Mm -hmm. So there'll be lectures in the morning, and in the afternoons, they'll spend time in the labs. And so we're recruiting our students and postdocs to work with these students that are visiting. Mm -hmm. So they'll actually do experiments or do simulations and, and then have to give a presentation at the end so that they you know, really f have to understand. You know, it's, when, you, when you have to give a presentation, it's a forcing function to really uh, understand what you've done as opposed to just sit there and passively listen. Right. So it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. active engagement. And, uh, you know, I think, I, I think they'll enjoy it. We've been sending 
our students to, to Princeton and Tsinghua and, and Lund and other summer schools mm -hmm. held by the Combustion Institute every year and they come back and they're very invigorated and, and they enjoy meeting the other students and, and you know, um, selfishly for us, they see how good they have it here, right. <laughs> right? Because they talk to other students and they talk and they view other labs and they're all 30, 40, 70 years old and they come back and like, wow, we, we really do have it nicer. You keep telling me we have it nice, but now I've seen how nice we have it. So, right. so it actually is a little bit self-serving, but it's good, it's good for our students to see right. how good they have it here. Um, I think there are some students at the conference right now. Uh, talk a little bit about getting students to come to, it, to conferences. So, so we have, um, through uh, Professor Fouché's office, we have money to bring in, uh, we brought in 22 students on travel stipends. Um, they, they apply for this and then we, um, you know, we, we uh, go through a selection process. And so we're looking for um, master's level or early PhD students mm -hmm. that um, can come in, can benefit from, from the conference, and, and use that to help guide their research. Right? We don't want a student that's six weeks away from defending because then they, it's hard for them to, to apply this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a great opportunity for them, um, and, and it's a good opportunity for us because we tend to be quite isolated and it's not the easiest place to come. Mm -hmm. They go back and they tell their friends and colleagues, cohorts, you know, Kaust is pretty good, you ought to take a look at it. Because, because it's the, um, you know, there's this energy barrier to, get, to coming to Kaust. And once you, uh, once you get over that and decide to come visit, mm -hmm. I, I've never taken anybody to the airport and not had them say, this is much better than I expected. Right? Mm -hmm. um, had them not say that, so. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. It's the, the key is to get them here. Right. Or have them talk to somebody that's been here physically. So mm -hmm. it's very effective for us. Right. Um, Dr. Driscoll, talk to us a little bit, um, uh, a bit more about your, your background and, and your research uh, coming from the aerospace side of things. Well, um, uh, I went to school during the space age, you know, and, uh, and, and was educated in the hypersonics area, high-speed flight, and so I was always excited about uh, high-speed aircraft, and uh, uh, combustion was natural because there were some issues. First. Uh, uh, if you fly a, a supersonic transport uh, up in the upper atmosphere, you're going to be producing pollutants, nitric oxide, mm -hmm. which produces smog, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has been a, a, a showstopper, uh, and it's prevented some countries from, from building these high-speed aircraft. And so we had to... Um, we, ha we had to uh, uh, do uh, combustion research to make the engines cleaner. And uh, if you look at movies of the old Concord, uh, it had a very dirty black exhaust. And anybody looking at that movie would say, you know, how do they, how are they allowed to fly those planes? And today, the, the uh, there's no soot in the exhaust of of, of jet aircraft, and uh, the nitric oxides are down by something like a factor of 50. So we've made huge improvements in reducing pollution. But uh, there's still more to be done because uh, there's still soot coming out of all hydrocarbon engines and we can do better. And so research is needed to, uh, to get to the, to the new goals that we want to uh, get to. But uh, high-speed flight's exciting. Uh, you know, uh, I flew here to Saudi Arabia and uh, would have been nice if we could have flown a little faster, <laughs> but uh, we will. I think uh, the next generation of, of of young people will be flying on faster aircraft, and uh, mm -hmm. um, they, I'm sure they'll be petroleum f fueled uh, mm -hmm. because aircraft have special needs. Um, but um, um, uh, now we have uh, 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 autonomous vehicles, and we'll be using that for, for transport, mm -hmm. and uh, that's exciting too. That's part of aerospace engineering, and it's also part of uh, propulsion, which is related to combustion. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, if, we, if we saw the, uh, the drones flying around in the, at the Olympics, at the uh, Winter Olympics, you could see that you could take thousands of little drones and, and uh, mm -hmm. fly yeah. them around. You could d deliver information, uh, yeah. deliver packages to people. Yeah. I think we're... Aerospace is still going to be an exciting area, and we need propulsion, which, which means we need combustion uh, to, to transport things by air. 
You, you're, you're both actually uniquely situated, I think, to, to talk a little bit about the future of, of mm -hmm. this area. So, so give us a, a sense of the things that you see as the future uh, of this research, whether it relates to the, the conference mm -hmm. that's going on now or, or otherwise. So um, in terms of uh, uh, energy production, mm -hmm. uh, certainly natural gas will, will dominate the, uh, t in terms of uh, hydrocarbons. Um, it's really hard to beat the energy density of, of a large hydrocarbon, right? So, um, for range, for for uh, large truck transportation, for ship transportation, for aircraft transportation, it's going to rely on hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. And when you look at uh, the passenger vehicle fleet, you talk about electrification, and, and that's certainly going to occur. And over the next 25 years, something like 75% um, of the vehicles will be electrified. But 90% of those vehicles will have an internal combustion engine. Right? Only a very small fraction, 8 or 10%, will be battery electric vehicles because the batteries are so heavy, it's so inefficient. So, so internal combustion engines are going to be around even as we electrify. And, and hybridization makes a lot of sense in terms of um, efficiency mileage. But, but now we want to look at you know, power density in the internal combustion engine. Can we make it smaller? Can we make it lighter? Can we uh, narrow the operating point where it runs? Because now you don't have to throttle it, right? If it's powering a, a generator that's going to power a battery, drives an electric motor, it can run at one spot, right, and the sweet spot. And so it can be very efficient, very clean, because you only, it only runs at one condition. So you can fine-tune that very well. And so we, we see... Um, moving towards uh, fuels that have a smaller footprint in terms, of a, in terms of processing. So what we'd like to do is find fuels that, that are a direct cut out of the crude spectrum. So we're not processing fuels to increase uh, octane rating, say. Um, because now you can generate, you can design the engine in conjunction with designing the fuel so that you understand the interaction between these two and you optimize both simultaneously to get high efficiency and low emissions. So in the internal combustion engine regime, we're moving in that. And we're moving, you know, now there are two varieties. There's the uh, compression ignition diesel engine and the spark ignited gasoline engine. And these are merging together, right? And you're finding various modes of, uh, of new thermodynamic cycles that, that mimic a little bit of the spark ignited and a little bit of the compression ignition engine and, and getting the advantages of each, the high, the high efficiency of the diesel engine with the low cost and low emissions of a gasoline engine. And as you do that, the fuel is going to look something other than, look like something other than gasoline or diesel. So what you'd like to do is find a fuel that requires no hydro processing, right? And so it's, uh, the, for the amount of energy you get in the fuel tank, you've done less work for it, less work to it. So that's in the transportation sector. Um, we're certainly looking at at uh, biofuels, renewable fuels, how do you transport hydrogen a a if we're going to move to a hydrogen economy? It probably is not going to be compressed hydrogen, right? I mean, it's just very difficult to do that safely and economically. So what are some hydrogen carriers? Maybe it's ammonia, NH3, or, or maybe it's methanol, right? So what are, the, what are the hydrogen carriers as you move to a hydrogen economy? How do you tie in peak loading to your renewables, how do you use energy storage is huge. I mean, the uh, solar cells now are, are very cheap, very inexpensive, uh, and wind is, is also very competitive, but the storage is the problem. So, you know, how do you store this energy? And, and storing it as a hydrocarbon makes a lot of sense. So how do you do that? How do you generate solar fuels, right? Convert photons from the sun into a hydrocarbon most effectively, most efficiently. Because I, I don't see that we're ever going to move away from hydrocarbons. I think the source of the hydrocarbons will change. Right? We're not going to keep pulling them out of the ground. Mm -hmm. but, but they're a fantastic molecule as an as a energy storage. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the direction. And then, of course, we'll be moving towards extreme conditions, right? as we put more and more constraints on the efficiency requirements, the pollution requirements. We'll see new thermodynamic cycles. We'll see very high pressures. We'll see very high... Uh, power densities, so very small, compact devices, and ones that, that we optimized, uh, again, to, to operate at their sweet point. So instead of trying to make it do everything, we'll ask it to do one thing extremely well. And, and then we, through controls or through various other mechanisms, get the range and performance characteristics that we want. So 
I, I think that's uh, where we're going. Um, we work closely with the Ramco. Um, we have a 10-year program on, f on essentially fuel engine interactions. And, and historically, engines have been developed, and then the fuel was parenthetically found. Um, but now, you know, you want to co-develop these. And as the, as the fuel mix, the, as the molecular and uh, functional groups change on the fuel molecules, how, how do you exploit those? Again, increase efficiency, decrease emissions. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, flames in engines are, are one way to go. But um, I, I believe at the Combustion Institute, you, you're also exploring some other uh, uses, even in medical technologies and things. Can you talk a little bit about yes. that? Yes. Uh, well, uh, flames have been used to produce uh, uh, chemicals or materials. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the white in, a white in the white paint is titanium dioxide, which is produced uh, by a chemical reaction in a flame. Um, and uh, uh, many of the things you put in epoxy and other materials are produced in flames. And in the medical field, um, uh, they have uh, uh, certain uh, needs and they can produce nanoparticles, very tiny particles that are made up of chemical species that are uh, produced by chemical reactions in flames. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of us think of soot as a bad thing that's a particle that's produced in a flame, but there are many um, uh, useful uh, products that are produced in flames that are uh, sold and uh, we need to make them more efficient and uh, uh, ma make them uh, of high quality mm -hmm. so they can be used in, uh, in medical and uh, even uh, food applications. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to, to carry on with that, you can now even change and manipulate the chemistry enough that you can form a, a particle of some substrate, titanium dioxide or so, and then put a, a functional coating on it, graphene, mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. If you control the chemistry well enough, mm -hmm. and so then you get very nicely uniform size with very uniform properties, and and that is very expensive to do now. But perhaps mm -hmm. through doing mm -hmm. it in flame generated nanoparticle synthesis, you can do it cheaply and and it scales well. Mm -hmm. So uh, us and a lot of other people are looking at you know how do you put functional coatings on these nicely shaped well characterized uh, nanoparticles and, right. and they have lots of lots of applications catalytic uh, surfaces um, mm -hmm. you can put uh, silver on them for um, um, antibiotic uh, activity mm -hmm. um, and i think the general public is aware of uh, golf clubs and tennis rackets that have nanoparticles in of them course. that are supposed to <laughs> help their performance but uh, that's that's uh, humorous, but uh, there are, you can you can make materials much stronger mm -hmm. if you can produce them again in, in a in a flame in a combustion environment, mm -hmm. and then synthesize them uh, into a very strong material. Mm -hmm. Is is um, are any of these areas of research that the CCRC is looking at, or, or even collaborating with other centers on on campus? Uh, on? So the material synthesis, we are working with SABIC mm -hmm. on scaling up. Um, mm -hmm. Just demonstrating a low-cost scale-up uh, of, of a particle that they're interested in. Um, that that was an area that we were interested in. It, it kind of waned, but now with the uh, emphasis on centers being more applied and, and technology deployment and translational for employment generation in the kingdom, mm -hmm. um, we've decided that is an area that we want to pick back up and be more aggressive at pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, this is the new direction for, for the KAUST centers mm -hmm. uh, in line with 2030, and so this is something that we were interested in, but it wasn't fundamental, and we decided that it wasn't something we wanted to get into, but now we've decided I mean, this really is an area that we should be actively involved in. So. Oh, very good. Okay. Um, well, any other any other thoughts about the the conference before we wrap up? I think it's going very well. It's only yeah. the first day, uh, so <laughs> uh, I'm sure there'll be glitches. But right. um, no, it's we have some very good speakers. Um, people are engaged, asking questions. And we want this to be dynamic and interactive, and uh, and and uh, hopefully they'll go home uh, after they see our facilities and talk to our people and say, you know, I want to be able to collaborate with Kaust, and that's what. One of the things that we want, right? We're trying to extend our global footprint and build collaborations, build pipelines for students, both students to come here and for our students to go out and get jobs.
Right? So these kind of interactions are very important for us. And uh, Kaust is, has a reputation now as being one of the world leading uh, uh, combustion uh, research facilities. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are many other places in the world that have been around for 100 years. And Kaust has been around for a lot less than 100 years, but it's built itself up to be one of the world leaders in a, in a short time. And it's really incredible. And we're, uh, we're happy to support it at the Combustion Institute, and we're happy to, uh, to, uh, to, to come and visit and see how you did it. Right. Well, thank you both for, for joining us. Thank Much you. appreciated, and, and enjoy the, the rest of the conference here. Um, and, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. We're going to be with uh, Deanna Lacoste and Sean Kearney. Uh, and that's all for this evening. Thank you.